it is true that you were on sabbatical. My students stood by me through that episode in which it was alleged that I was a racist. Right. Uh, alleged by students who'd literally never met me. Um, there's a reason for that. And it is because I, and when you and I were both teaching, you and I were teaching things that were highly relevant to questions like this. We specifically, we did not avoid questions of race. We talked about mm -hmm. the fact that um, race is a racist instantiation of a correct biological phenomenon. Lineage mm -hmm. is real. Race is a bastardization used to disadvantage people, right? Or traditionally it has been. We talked about why evolutionarily that would be the case. And we talked significantly about what biology has to say about the remedy here. And what I think folks on the right frequently get wrong mm -hmm. is that they do not understand how much of this is uh, remediable if one actually looks at the deep causation. In other words, the populations that have persistently not done well in our system are populations that were systematically disadvantaged, that were effectively had their culture scrambled in order to make them compliant, right? And so understanding that, it's not a fun topic to think about, yeah. but understanding that history and why it has taken some groups and made it difficult for them to overcome past hobbling is crucial. I don't see how we solve this without an understanding of that. And, you know, doing what many on the right do, which is pretending that or mistakenly concluding that it is some sort of uh, unfortunate but inherent characteristic, right? That doesn't help. Mm -hmm. And um, pretending that the only thing going on is that there are bad people stealing from good people and that transfer of wealth is the way to do this, that doesn't work. What yep. we need to do is actually look the problem squarely in the eye and say, you know, populations that have faced uh, a persistent obstacle. What is special about the history there? Because when you look, you find it, right? It was a disruption. Uh, and, you know, really the only model that I think will suffice here is one in which you understand that culture and genes are equally biological, right? Yeah. Because there was a lot of damage done culturally and intentionally so. So I believe it's Thomas in his uh, concurring opinion who points out that, uh, and this you know this will be, this will be regarded by those who are decrying this decision as sort of standard conservatives talking points. But, but really, uh, Thomas points out uh, that the specific population of students uh, who uh, are have been disincentivized from applying to Harvard because their rates of acceptance are going down um, are East Asian students, I believe. And there's actually a lot of stuff around too, like what even does Asian mean? So, I, you know, South Asian, East Asian, but uh, I, I, I think it was East Asian. I may have that wrong. Maybe just say Asian. Um, <clears throat> but Thomas, uh, in, his, in his concurring opinion, says, isn't that a population that in this country at least part of them were literally put into camps in World War II. And they are the ones being discriminated against now, not asking for help, um, but having, having come through that, which was heinous, which was deplorable American policy. Yep. Right? Uh, and some of the people who are downstream of exactly the people who were incarcerated by the American government on American soil, these were including, you know, American citizens, Japanese American citizens, um, whose descendants are now having a hard time getting into elite institutions. Because why? Because too many of them tick too many of the boxes that make them look like really good academic bets. That confuses the story of Past injustice makes it difficult to pull yourself up. It just does. Right. Um, but again, I want to make this clear. We have examples of populations that have faced real disadvantages that have succeeded in our system. And we have advantages of populations that persistently struggle. The distinction, in my opinion, is based entirely 
in whether or not the culture of those groups survived intact, right? Systematic disruption of yep. the culture of Native Americans and African Americans is the distinction. It's not endogenous capacity. And that is not mm. a fun point to recognize, but it is a point that has a tremendous amount of hope built into it because once you realize that actually there was a systematic campaign to hobble, it took place at the cultural level. And the fact is, yeah, you can have come to the US, you can have been ghettoized into a Chinatown or a little Japan or whatever it was, but you kept your culture and yep. that culture is the bootstraps, right? So there, there's hope there in some ways, but it's also there's also a kind of hopelessness, I think, because uh, just as you, you've said this often, you, you can't create a myth. You can't write a myth. You can't. You can write a story um, that, if it's really compelling, may stand the test of time and become a myth. Uh, in general, you also can't invent a religion, although people seem to be working on that. Um, but you also can't really create a culture overnight no but so having having you know emerged from uh intact cultures that were scrambled intentionally in order to um create enforced compliance by how like what what then what then is to be done well i mean I, this is this is the answer is that culture i mean it's, i'm not telling you anything you don't know mm. and haven't written extensively about but culture is the secret sauce of humans. And the interesting thing about it, right, as a biological phenomenon that is typically handed down vertically, it is transmissible horizontally, and that's why it's special. And the point is, the real answer involves democratizing the culture that we share as Americans, right? Why do I think of George Washington as my forefather? He's not my forefather. Right, but he is my forefather because he's the forefather of my culture, and it is the extent to which the culture has been uh, distributed in an unfair way, and that that persists into the present. Now, it's a very difficult problem to solve. Now, yeah, because... I, I mean, I feel like there's two there's two big barriers to this. One of them is um, most modern American culture isn't fantastic. That's not what I'm talking about. And the other big barrier is, of course, that it's not actually the government or the press secretary that raises the children, right? It, it, or the teachers, right? They're not, they're, that's not their job and that's not their right. It's the families. So, the, you know, the cultural stuff exists at the family level. Um, you know, family, families bring in the culture and teach it to their children, uh, but absent families you know, we may all be swimming in some kind of a general, if you're in America, like cultural American soup, uh, but but the the way that you end up with with the values and the historicity and the you know the 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 habits of both mind and body are going to happen kind at the individual level, largely at home. Largely at home, except you're dealing with a. I mean, look. This is how you get to game B, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because once you realize that this is not a problem that can be remedied by minor tweaks to what we've got and then we don't have to worry about it anymore, you realize you're talking about a total restructuring. But at the moment, you're dealing with um, corporations that study the minds of young people to figure out how to trick them into spending money on things that harm their health and damage their minds, yeah. right? You can't have a society in which you get rich by externalizing harm onto other people, right? So this is one of a dozen different places that we could point to, well, yes, the family is where you get your values, but how difficult is it to pass on values when somebody just outside your door or coming in through your kid's iPad or whatever is trying to induce them to see the world upside down so that they will spend money in some way? So we so have a predatory society. This this is true, but you also need um, that family has to be intact. Of course, of course. But again, even that, even that. Why is it that um, black families are more likely to be single parent families? Right. The answer to that question, it turns out, is tied up in a skewed sex ratio. Sex ratio 
that is the result of a massive level of incarceration of black males. What that does is it hobbles black females in uh, negotiations between the sexes. That is to say, if black females do not have black males in large numbers, then those who exist uh, outside of the system of incarceration are in extra high demand. It's very hard to get them to settle down. So that is not a feature inherent to a population. That is a result of circumstances. Now, I'm not excusing the disproportionate level of criminality. On the other hand, that is downstream. Circumstances are perpetuating themselves because the young men are growing up in environments in which it clearly makes more sense by most by, by most analyses uh, to sell drugs on the street than to go to terrible, uh, dangerous schools. Yeah, I mean, you know, these are dangerous conversations to have because, yeah. you know, in order to get the nuance right, you have to nail every word. But the right. point is, look, nobody chooses a life of crime who has great alternatives, right? You choose a life of crime because it actually beats the alternatives that you do have. And so the structure of the civilization that creates that predicament that causes people to engage in crime because it's their better option that's the thing that needs to be cured is does that is it as simple as recognizing that of course not but you know we were just zach and i our producer um we're just talking about this yesterday in a different domain which was sex work mm -hmm. right nobody chooses no, no no little girl dreams about being on the pole or worse, right? Or selling her body for sex. That is a choice that some people end up making because circumstances have provided a bunch of choices in which that appears to be the best one. And in some of their cases, it is the best one. And that's terrible. Yep. That does not make it an awesome choice. It makes their circumstances terrible and something that we do have a responsibility at the societal level, to consider how to address something that does not involve penalizing those who are hardworking and skillful and making a go of it. Absolutely. Now, the fundamental at the bottom of all of this, and you know, we don't really know this, but everything that I have seen tells me that people are, uh, while far from blank slates, are overwhelmingly similar in their capacity at birth. Mm. And that what happens is a wild distortion of developmental environments where some yeah. people have the benefit of really good developmental environments. Some people have bad developmental environments that teach them a very important lesson that results in them doing well. That's also- Skyrocket. Right. right. But anyway, the let's put it this way. The idea that there is something that we can't really talk about, you know, endogenous differences in capacity, blah, 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 blah. That becomes an excuse not to address the problem because it's like, well, it's genes. But the evidence that it's genes is not anywhere near as strong as people think it is mm -hmm. because they don't understand the problems with the term heritability. They don't understand what it right. really means. And they don't understand how it is that something can be genetically heritable and not be a blueprint that's inescapable. Lots of genetically heritable stuff is perfectly remediable at a non-genetic level. And if that sounds like a paradox to you, that's because you don't understand what biologists mean when they say heritable, right? I swear it's a, it's a very broken term because the common parlance implications of it have nothing to do with the actual biological meaning of it. 